discussion, and I'm really seeing myself as just a placeholder. Uh, this has been titled Performing Artists Present Collaborations in a Time of Crisis. Um, during the, I was at the artist uh, luncheon just now, and some of, I think two or three of you were in that session as well, um, and I, I mentioned that we were going to do this, and I put out to visual artists as well, because I realized from that discussion that it's that most of the issues really uh, go beyond disciplinary bounds. Um, so, and I, can I have a quick show of hands? How many people, pr you know, we all wear many hats. Um, how many people, though, pr let, let's say, first of all, primarily identify as an artist among their many roles? Okay, so about seven or eight, okay. How many as presenters? Okay, so about five, six. Um, how many in some other role, and if so, what? What is um, man, booking agent, manager, interpreter, Life and, trans and translator. <laughs> like, yeah. I think in, in uh, I'm sort of jumping <coughs> out, one of the things that I get frustrated about, I'm going to call you out by starting this great start. I feel Absolutely. Like, um, but just that oftentimes these conversations are about presenters and artists. Yeah. When the agent manager is so often right. just taken out of the conversation right. and like and put to the bottom of the heap in terms of even the so the power structures right. when they're so integral to this right. to making this world go round. Right. So let's come on in Sammy. Can we maybe make a substitute for the chairs and can you can just can you just zoom in real quick? Real easy. I'm going to do the chair. Oh okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Either way. Know? Um, so yes, so what Hina is saying, so let's think of this not in terms of not only a, a hierarchy or linear, obviously, but in terms of, and not just dialogic, but circular. So there is no, uh, I'm always emphasizing as an educator in the classroom that, um, you know, it's a very simple thing, you know, teachers of all grade levels and, and levels do it. Um, but let's just remind ourselves in a very simple way that this is a circular dialogue. There is no beginning, middle, or end point. There is no, uh, there is no higher uh, position. Um, we're all equal in that way. Um, for those of you who thought Ananya Chatterjee was going to be co-facilitating with me, because that's what it actually says on paper or, or on the website, uh, Ananya unfortunately had to bow out because she had to bow out coming to the conference few days ago, so she's she's not only not here at the meeting, but she's not here this weekend, but she sends her regards. Um, so I will try my best to hold space uh, for everyone solo. But um, in the interest of time, I want to dive in without doing introductions. I'd like the introductions to kind of come by default. Um, originally, the session was supposed to be two hours, and then I found out a couple days ago it was only 90 minutes. So um, I didn't know that they had changed the schedule. So um, really quick. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the overview. Idea form, in performing artists presented dialogues in a time of crisis. In this time of acute upheaval, oppression, violence, both threats, and other crises, the social meaning and sense of identity are against theater, music, and performance, are, and all media are as impactful as ever. For better or worse, audiences are primed for the work in some way uh, that we present on stage and the experiences we provide of offstage and community and educational settings. In response, this collective idea sharing and brainstorming session is designed for artists and presenters and all people, uh, all roles, asking vital questions and searching for collaborative answers. What are the emergencies facing artists and presenters in our historical moment? What movements, images, sounds, and stories are engaged artists called to create? And how do presenters and collaborators uh, see their roles and responsibilities changing? What solutions are we capable of for embodying uh, capable of embodying for audiences, and how can artists and presenters innovate together <coughs> to nurture and transform the, lands, the arts landscape? So for these 90 minutes, at which we're now 10 minutes in, we'll identify the most pressing issues for participants in the room and then work on each in breakout groups, <coughs> making safe spaces for difference, revealing encourages their stories, sounding out positive and proactive measures, and proposing and choreographic responses, as well as civil measures. <coughs> Each group will then present their quote, solution, and response, and then we'll finish with final individual agreements to some form of implementation. Anybody want to comment very, very briefly, quickly on any of this as a kind of first
premise of the next 80 minutes that we spend together. Questions? Anything? Cautionaries? I'm not a perfect human being. <laughs> Meaning I wrote this, um, but that doesn't mean necessarily anything. It's just a, an initial thing. Okay. Uh, so what I'd like to do for the first, now, 20 minutes, let's say, uh, continue with introductions, prompts. So I just gave you some initial prompt questions uh, in the overview um, about urgencies, about um, stories, roles, responsibilities. Um, and I want to also, uh, so I want, us to, I want to just open up the space to that, but um, I also want to throw out these other additional prompts. Um, we're not going to get through all these. These are just things that, these are just possibilities. Why do artists make work? Why do presenters present? What does that even mean? What, is it, what does presentation and art making mean? What does facilitating, translating, representation mean? Um, what are the most pressing issues for you in the room? Um, and briefly, as briefly and succinctly as you can describe, what are some examples of successes, failures, challenges in your experience of artist-presenter collaborations and partnerships? Um, built into that, prompt, that question, of course, are each of your variable definitions of success, failure, et cetera. Um, where are the areas for potential collaboration and partnership? What is the exact role of audience and community for you, your organization? How much of a priority is it for you to make them a, quote, partner? And how do you define all those things? And I'm going to sit because I don't want to stare. <coughs> um, so having said all that, um, Sorry, the last thing I'll also say is an introduction, just as a qualifier. Um, for me, this is not a space allowing for uh, art, entertainment, or ideas for their own sake, except in cases where doing so is a political or sociocultural gesture. This workshop is intended equally for sharing, meeting, brainstorming, and most of all, devising. I say that mostly because of some, some issues, for example, that came up during the artist luncheon, which is, and I can't remember who brought it up, but the, the point about how some people, there's always this like, I'm here to make connections, I'm here to, to get a gig or to find some artists, uh, to, to build relationships, but there's always, so there's always this awkward, I need you, I am gonna hold back, I need you, I'm gonna hold back, I need you, I'm gonna hold back. So I just want us to say, you know, again, sit in a circle and just not even, you know, just not really worry about that. I can't stop anyone from thinking about that. We can't stop ourselves from being aware of who we are in this space and what we are and what we do. But I want us also just to think in terms of possibility and potential. So I'm going to shut up. Um, I just want to open it up um, and I will take notes um, as we go along. Um, I would just ask, I guess, first of all, does anybody have any does anybody maybe want to throw out some definitions to start us with? You know, what what is what is it what does a what does it mean for an artist or a presenter or a you know agent, facilitator, manager? Um, what does it mean for them to collaborate? What are what is the nature? What is the nature of what's the nature of that type of relationship? Why do we why does that relationship even exist? Oh, yeah, sorry. Why don't we use that just, it's right there. And can I just say something with the mic? Oftentimes people say, oh, I'm loud enough, I can hear it. Recognize it's not for you that you're speaking into the mic. It's for making sure that everyone has the ability to hear. Yeah, some people are yeah. less able than others. I am not good at speaking up, so. <laughs> <laughs> or projecting, I should say. Um, I think that relationship is, uh, a super, super intimate one. Um, and just like all intimate relationships becomes emotional, um, personal, as well as professional. Um, and can be fraught with all of the problems that come in with an emotional, personal relationship. Maybe like an arranged marriage. <laughs> <laughs> say that the idea, I'm Christina Wong, I'm a performance artist and a political candidate, and um, I, 
uh, she, her, hers. And, and I, uh, when you say, what does collaborator mean? And I was like, oh, I, I never really think of it as I'm collaborating with a presenter, because it, it, that's the most transactional relationship, right? It's like, okay, so I got this show, and then they get the, maybe they chime in with, oh, maybe we can schedule it around this time. To, for the, like, it's, does that's, that's maybe where the creativity really comes in is like, when, when should we put this up and who should we invite? But it, it doesn't, um, uh, I think with, with the new pieces that I'm trying to propose, it's a little bit more ambitious because I'm asking for a, a venue that won't charge tickets, you know, and that kind of, st and, and asking to get out of the way they present, maybe the way they have. But I mean, that, that, this is sort of a mind blowing idea. How do you collaborate with a presenter when yeah. it's a trans transaction? Can I just uh, give a quick tangent to that? So, and, and uh, not denying at all, uh, and, and actually acknowledging very much so, the fact that it is often, as you just described, a you know, thought of as a transactional, you know, let's say for lack of a better term, you know, what someone said last hour business relationship. Um, I'm also, the, the reason that I've sort of crea I created this forum was, is also to try and either get away from or add to that you know that mindset. Um, I'll let you. I'll let the group decide whether they want to change that or substitute it or something. So, um, someone had their hand up over here. Maybe you can each hand the mic off to each other. Um, yes, my name is uh, Vincent Burwell. Uh, I am a producer, a commercial producer, in, a, in addition to being an artist, which is slightly different in a commercial sense um, than the not-for-profit model. Um, but um, the relationships seem to be, being on both sides, kind of um, very symbiotic because one needs the other. To, one often needs the other to exist and to realize their their dream and the goal. Um, so I, the thing that comes to mind, the word that comes to mind is symbiosis, um, <clears throat> because we're both facilitating each other's needs, and sometimes we delve into each other's realms. It's kind of like a Venn diagram where we kind of overlap. Because there are ambition, there are often ambitions as presenters to feel a part of the artistic process, and as artists, we want to make sure that we have a key or have access into how we are presented to make sure that we're presented in the light that we want to be presented in as artists. And so that's the constant, constant jockeying for position, um, and each first each entity needs the other one to succeed. As a producer, I kind of, well, I look at it from a monetary standpoint. Um, which is kind of, um, it's very different. It's a, it's a completely different model um, because we're talking about communication. And um, so I can have a foot in both worlds and it's self-gratifying. But ultimately, I want to make sure that as a producer, I present the work that I believe in. And as an artist, when I'm getting my work presented, I want to make sure that the presenter is presenting me the way that I feel like my voice should be heard. And so it's symbiotic. No, actually, I'm just ready for the exciting to come back for Sam and Kim. Question. So I think um, this makes me realize that what I was describing was a curator relationship with an artist, which is very different from a presenter relationship with artists. And one thing that I've run into is when people treat me like a transaction when I want to collaborate. And that is probably the most frustrating experience ever. Yeah. I, I imagine also on all sides. But I, 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 I think no, but being the, the, no, but yeah. being the I was going to say, but being the presenters is so often the easy target of that type of mindset. Yeah, because then I get boxed in before they even give me a chance. Right. I liked your earlier metaphor of connecting it to an arranged marriage. And one way, and for a lot of reasons, but one way I think about arranged marriages is a commitment to a community. If you compare that to other kinds of marriages, that what you're committing to is a legacy and what you're committing to is like continuing something on. And the ways in which artists and presenters have a commitment to communities, be it geographic or be it social or be it emotional, like whatever the ways that those communities intersect. So I think that's a common ground on which hopefully we can we can uh, commune across difference and conversation that conversations can happen. Um, 
examples of collaboration, partnering, sharing, some other term that you might have? Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm Andre Zachary, uh, Renegade Performance Group from Brooklyn. Um, I can really say, uh, most recently, the um, relationship I had with the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio, was, was extremely uh, informative. It, it felt very supportive. Um, I felt that I was able to be uh, entered into community coming from Brooklyn and then being in Columbus for an entire season uh, this fall. I was also teaching at Ohio State. The way in which I was able to enter community felt very good. It wasn't something where it's just like I'm coming, which I have felt before in generations before. It's kind of like this thing, especially being a New York based artist, like, oh, I'm going to come in and like show this community how it's done, which I, I, I cannot stand. Um, but it was more like, okay, Columbus has an amazing and, and rich history, which I actually need to learn about for myself. And I felt that the Wexner Center provided that opportunity for me, along with the King Arts Complex, uh, Javon uh, Collins. And I think that there is a way in which um, uh, education can happen for the artists themselves before they actually enter a space. So not necessarily saying, well, we're gonna, you're going to bring this amazing work but more like, okay, actually, you are working in a certain way that actually you can learn, we can learn from community, as you were just saying. Um, and I mean, who knows, maybe that might get away from the more presenter artist model where it's produce work, show work, make money, fill seats, where it is something where spend time, you know, get to know people, get to see youth, you know, in a workshop at Wexner, and then Later on, I'm going to a break in battle, and I'm seeing the same youth, and you know, I'm they're like, "Hey, Mr. Zachary, how you doing?" I was like, "Oh, what's going on?" You know, and it's something. It's it's genuine, and not a moment there felt forced, not a moment. And so I think that uh, I guess the long story short is um, perhaps we can allow time to work in a different way. Can I ask you a, 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 a context question? So you said if you valued the ability for you as the artist to educate yourself about the context you're stepping into beforehand. What about the presenter educating themselves about, about your situation? Uh, the presenter edu educating themselves about me and my work? Or, or whatever they needed to, because in, so, that it's, so that the onus isn't simply on one side. Um, I feel the presenter, and, and, as, and again, in as much time as, as possible with, with all of our work and you know, our careers and what we're doing, um, my work being based in Afrofuturism um, allowed, the presenter did have the time to really say, okay, this is what Andre specifically is doing with Afrofuturism. Um, Lane Chaplinsky, who was at uh, Webster Center, took the time to do an interview and podcast with me. And that was, that was a creative way for Lane also to get a better sense of like, okay, what does Afrofuturism mean for me? Not, does, not necessarily saying like, okay, you know, Lane, go and read, you know, all these a million books. Like, of course, we don't have, always have time for that. But it was a very simple and creative way for education to happen on both sides. I was able to understand, okay, Lane, what do you value? Lane was able to understand a little bit deeper. Okay, this is what Andre is valuing with the work as well before it enters right. Wexner Center. And then strategizing, you know, up until I even got to Columbus for months, we have been communicating with Javon as well, King Arts Complex. A lot of communication helped uh, prior to the uh, uh, my time coming, I, and I think it's just allowing those channels to be open. Would you be okay? Would you be okay if I labeled that? Because the the, the 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 idea that's coming to my head is a dialogue of mutuality. That sounds good. Okay, thanks. Um, Michelle De La Ressa with Attack Theater um, here in Pittsburgh, and I think one of the things that makes that Kind of relationship more collaborative and less, um, to use your words, transactional, is also if there is sometimes a, an opportunity for the artist to help morph uh, their offering, our offering, to almost solve a problem um, or to look at a challenge. I'll call it a challenge. And I'm just thinking of a recent example in St. Louis. It was actually the non-traditional presenter. It was um, AAM, um, the Museum Association, and it was for the featured uh, speaker series. And they said, we know your work well, but here's a challenge. We need 
is it possible that in some ways interactive with about 500 people, can it be on the stage, but can we create something that is more interactive and dialogue based with the audience? And so it's looking at what we already, what we're working on, what our um, body of work is, and then being willing with the presenter to collaborate and um, shift the perspective a little bit. And I think that that goes to what you were saying about that it becomes um, beneficial for the artist because then we've challenged ourselves to create something, maybe it's not a premiere, maybe it's not brand new, but something different or from a frame it differently than we would have ever before if that challenge wasn't given to us. but then I've also, the other role, I didn't identify at the beginning, but I am an artist as well. Um, but the relationships that I think have been most successful is when there's a common, there is the shared needs, right, or the individual needs, but a clear understanding of what the goals are for each party mm -hmm. and where they do overlap and where they diverge and focusing on sort of the overlapping spaces and understanding what the give and take is going to be um, in that. And an example of that is my, my first work as a producer and artistic director was working with a venue who said, we want to bring in the South Asian community to our space in our, and we want to create this, we want, I want something that's gonna appeal to the hipsters and the grannies, was literally what I was given, right? Like, you know, give me something that's gonna be hipsters and the grannies. I'm like, all right, I actually have this idea, what if we did a show like this? And she's like, huh, okay, that sounds interesting. Now, the venue was Lincoln Center, and there's, it's an a, a old institution, huge with a lot of bureaucracy. The woman there is a white cisgender woman. And I was, she tr she's like, I find people that I, I trust and then I let them go and do, she's like, I don't know anything about what you're about to do. You tell me what you're doing, but my job is to use my privilege within this institution to push aside all the red tape so you can do what you need to do but you need to keep me updated, right? Like, so it was constant communication, right? She would push back. She's like, I don't think this is gonna work in our space. And I would have to kind of sort of convince her. And there's times where I'm like, just trust me, man. But those questions also made me think deeper about why I'm making certain decisions, right? So um, it was a beautiful, what I found that was beautiful was that one, it's an organization like Lincoln Center, right, to be able to go, hey, they trust me now, that's just elevated sort of my sort of reputation in the field, right? But she's also like, I have this privilege, how am I going to use this to elevate other voices? So. Um, can we get to really quick into one of the other questions, and then I'm going to identify themes for the breakout groups. Time consideration. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, talk really quickly about uh, or mention audience or audience, community, maybe other words, other contexts uh, for how you think about, you know, who who you're serving, who you're partnering with on a on a larger scale. Um, who's the Yes. So that's. Uh, I'm really curious about that because. Um, just one of the reasons I created the Taco Truck Theater Project, simply because I've been touring across the country with a lot of MPN support, some fabulous presenters here who have supported the work for 20 something years. But in doing so, um, you know, it's not easy when you bring in just uh, an artist or Latin American political provocative performance artist to think that the entire Latino community in your city where you haven't presented uh, Latino artists or Latinx artists or Latin American artists. And, I'm from Ecuador, so you know it's, it's not like there's going to be tons of Ecuadorians rushing to that theater. So um, this would happen quite often, just because it does. Uh, the responsibility falls upon sometimes the artist thinking that they're going to bring in this community when the center itself doesn't have a legacy of doing that. 
And that's a really big challenge because they've been dealing with a very Eurocentric plantation paradigm. Sometimes I use big words and therefore I feel superfluous. Um, but one of the reasons why I created the Taco Truck Theater Project was simply because I wanted to bring the work to the people. We have a truck, we have a stage, and right now we're raising the funds to bring it to the African American communities in the Lower Ninth. We're bringing it in, uh, to um, the immigrant communities in Metro New Orleans, including immigrant communities in Chalmette, Kenner, and the suburbs. Because with all the outreach I can do, and I do a lot to bring black, brown, and white people together through the projects in New Orleans, um, we sometimes can't get the communities that we're looking to get to the theater, especially immigrant communities that are afraid of facilities. Even New Orleans Museum of Art presented the work early this year. And I had arranged with them for anyone that was an immigrant act uh, with the Congress or the Congress of Day Laborers, the immigrant activist group, all they needed to do was bring their IDs and even, and, and, but not their, because you know, there's an ID issue, but to bring in their documentation that was part of, uh, uh, little cards that said that they were part of Congress, but we also made an initiative to let people know in the community that they could come to the museum and see the work outside. But that within itself is a barrier because the, it's not like the museum has been, you know, working with that immigrant community. But they did something radical because the educational um, presenter who approached me to do it wanted to, and we, we publicly announced in our National Public Radio interviews that yes, the immigrant community was welcome to come and see the show gratis, to see it. But it wasn't like they still rushed because the center, the, the New Orleans Museum of Art, you know, just presented recently, you know, Puerto Rican artists. But again, you're dealing with a legacy of exclusion and uh, it's always been, ¿Cómo le traigo el teatro de la gente a la gente? How do I bring a people's theater to people? That's always been a challenge for me and many of us, because we're working, and yes, we're wonderful, it's, it's great kudos. Lincoln Center, by the way, was built on the blood of so many African Americans and Puerto Ricans uh, during a time in the 50s, because I'm a renegade scholar from New York, and they called it um, uh, spig removal. So Lincoln Center has a really tragic history of how it's been built. So, you know, I don't want to go on further other than, than just those are still challenges. And they've been challenges for 25 years that I've been involved with this now. If I could ask you to distill that whole experience down, because there's five things you could say, but if, if I were to ask you to just name one uh, in terms of the takeaway of that, that conversation or collaboration between you and the presenter uh, in terms of priority or something that's most urgent, what would you, what would you say off the top of your head? Well, even in Vanderbilt, we sold out aliens, immigrants, and other evildoers, right? And, and uh, predominantly, you know, Vanderbilt University presented it. But we have, in Nashville, there's a big immigrant community. So one of the things to really get to, we, I brought the unplugged version to a community center. Now, Nashville, Vanderbilt University offered all these free tickets, but there's still that legacy. I think that the challenge is how do Eurocentric spaces engage in trying to do the community outreach, not, that's not just a one-way street, right? And you can't expect and that artists of color, black, brown, Asian, that you're bringing in to do that work for you when it hasn't been done. And you can't just hire a person of color who's the new outreach communicator or outreach director who's gonna make miracles happen at your Eurocentric plantation presenting space. I don't know. Alliteration is sometimes a problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, these are, these are challenges. Just putting, there are no magic POCs. Yes. <laughs> there are no magic POCs. And I'm not a big fan of POC. I think it should be melanin people of power. Yeah. So I'm just saying. But, you know, these are challenges. And one of the reasons, like, how do we bring... El teatro de la gente necesita ser... Que la vea la gente. You know, people still people need to see it. Well, I want to piggyback on you know, what uh, Torrentama was talking about. And building the community is, is the presenting that I have been wanting to do, or trying to do, not wanting to, but trying to do uh, for many, many years. It's not that easy. It's not that easy to bring your community 
into a space that they have never been. And I mean, you can have to go and say, I do that or come and see me. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, why would I go and see you? If I see you every day. So we need to find ways to make that invitation uh, uh, oh. make it welcoming for them and try to understand their needs. And sometimes we don't do that. We see it by them, oh, well, I'm saying you should go see me because I'm in your community. No. It's like we need to figure out a way to make it welcoming for them as the community that they are. And that's a big challenge. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're a half hour in where I even started, which was already a little bit later, and it felt, it's felt like five minutes to me. So um, I would, I, I'd like, and again, I want this, I want the group to be, you know, have power over this. I'm, I'm trying to just really be a facilitator or a space holder. Um, my idea was to do breakout groups at this point along certain themes, but I'm wondering, so we could either do that, or, but I'm also wondering if we want to just do a limited number of breakout groups and just come up with, you know, the solutions that come up from those groups for this type, uh, just this overall idea of collaborations. I'm going to stop saying, uh, you know, according to your prompt, artist presenter collaborations. I'm just going to say uh, presentation collaborations, maybe, maybe, and maybe you guys can keep it, come up with some even better terms. Would it be um, possible to use some positive responses uh, to somebody's concerns uh, that may be yeah, helpful maybe one, Yeah, maybe one more, yeah, positive, successful example real quick in like a minute or two before we break out. Um, I, I guess I was tangentially part of it, but um, I, I was one of the dandy minions in Taylor Max 24-hour oh, yeah. piece. Yeah. I have no idea how that gets financed. That seems like the most, it's, it's amazing. I think the effects it has in creative communities is incredible, but like I, I'm just like my mother sitting there adding up the numbers of how much this this 24 hour show with a cast of like 100 people or more <laughs> costs. And, uh, but to me, I, I'm like, that's, that's, an, that's an amazing risk for a presenter to have that relationship um, with this artist to, to go, yeah, we'll do a show for this long. We'll, 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 we'll run a six hour show, union time, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> So to me, I, I think I've been inspired looking at that going, okay, I think presenters are beginning to have vision about doing more than selling tickets, but really creating experiences and communities and stuff. Okay, I'm going to write creating experiences. Okay, so um, again, uh, being the uh, clock keeper, um, so I'm thinking, let's say, we want to say 20 minutes, so till 3.30, breakout groups. Um, I think we should, we need to limit the number of groups because otherwise we'll be recording till, till 6 p.m. Um, let's, I wanna say, because I wanna leave time for actual like s commitments at the end uh, as uh, in addition to the recording backup solution idea, responses ideas. So I'm gonna say three groups, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's gonna go like the, it's, it's not gonna go like that because you're gonna have a lot to say. Is that okay? Okay, so um, I could just arbitrarily divide or yeah. people wanna, yeah? Okay, so 
line between the two of you, yes. <laughs> That's a line. Um, here's a line. And um, so, and so let's come back at 3.30. Um, and, um, and you'll each have five minutes, because I want to hold the last 15 minutes to going around and people making some kind of uh, final sort of action plan or commitment things. Even if it's just a tiny thing, like I'm going to make this phone call, or I'm going to talk to this person, or I'm going to write this down and actually show it to someone. Even if it's something as simple as that, that's something more than you had committed to an hour ago. So, okay? Thank you. Um, talking about this this idea of um, of presentation collaborations, what are some what are some ideas for solutions? What are what are some principles, uh, some premises, uh, you know, operate operate operational, functional, or ethical, you know, to, to guide ourselves by and to, to, to actually you know, and practical as well. Because you guys all have created solutions. Yes. Is there way we can like maybe maybe the space a little bit more? Because I don't know. It might just to like, I don't know. It might just be like all artists. And then, yeah. Oh yes, actually, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, we, we need to make sure that there are uh, uh, a number of different types of pe people with different types of roles. Um, for the interest of time, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I have say. another agent manager. Yes. Okay. So so you don't you don't you two are not in the same group. So anybody who's not an artist or presenter primarily. Please split yourselves up between the three groups. Um, so, and those of you who are, I think there are, there are more artists in this room so than quote unquote presenters. So presenters, organizational people, if you could kind of split yourselves up between the various groups. Um, we have a funding person in the group here. So. <laughs> yeah, who's a presenter? Who's a presenter? Okay. There, yeah, you're kind of leaning on this side. Okay, so maybe, okay, why don't you guys stay there. Maybe two of you, two, one or two of you at least come over here. And then maybe another artist or two on this side, because this was majority, majority presenters. Thank you all. Okay, so let's come back in 17 minutes. And if you want to use the pad or someone can type up notes, uh, on you know, like digitally, and then you can email them to me, and I'll send them to you, or I'll try and get find some way to send them to everyone.
shortened Anything to that's bring back, please that's, write it down. That's a cyber space now. Or yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't like it, was, it took forever. But I don't know if I As a center of your ethic, you're not here for because yeah. as an artist in our space, in a way, I'm going to be coming at you. I would also be able to support him by my parents. I love the value as an artist in the arts and realize you take precedence on me. Yeah, that was my experience. Yeah, that's actually true. There were a lot of things. You've got to get a building now to make this that the place. We talked about money. I've been searching for a lot of things. I wonder. No, but there's a lot of things. I don't want to be trained with a decision to get the decision. So I want to be in this company as a track record. Where's the last one? I'm going to pay some tickets.
it's not something that works. Like, I wear this tag, and I was like, I can't say why I don't want to say the majority of the tag. But I'll say is, I feel very strongly about the history and theory and practice. And I don't know if you can say that before, even the season of the art, before the art, Let's come back to the circle, folks. I know we can we can do this forever. Let's come back to the circle, guys. Oh, I guess the sorry, I guess the push back was the thing that like people would send it like that. People come up. What is it? And I know, just acknowledging that this whole this session as a whole is really, really more just a provocation than anything else. Oh my gosh! Because we could be here. We could have a whole conversation. What should we think about? Hello. Sorry. Should be so bad. Thank you, everyone. Um, those who didn't hear what I just said. I, I, I think we're here, just even this hour and a half is really just like a provocation for this whole topic. Um, but I wanna take the time, we have 24 minutes left. Uh, I wanna be respectful of people's time. Some of you may have appointments at four o'clock. Um, for those of you who are willing to maybe stay a couple minutes over, because I think we've got some really amazing Creative Juice is going, um, obviously we can do that as well. <laughs> Although I have a meeting at 4.15 as well. Um, so, without, so without further ado, can we hear back in summary form, uh, ideas, principles, <laughs> guidelines, um, responses, uh, solutions, quote unquote, from each group. So who wants to go first? Who can go first? I'm gonna hand this mic to somebody. Please, take it from me. Take this mic away from me. I try to be as quick as possible. So um, the first problem that we identified, how do we remove the vetting process of white filtering from bringing forth artists, meaning um, non-gendered, um, beyond binary, black, brown, queer, international artists into spaces with their work. First solution, having more black and brown international artists queer, non-gender, non-binary artists uh, and pe persons as leaders in the spaces and institutions. Two, challenging local presenters slash curators to develop work with artists in their near and dear homegrown communities. Three, growing affinity groups that have influence and reputation in the arts to amplify the voices with whom they have collective strength, speaking on behalf of their community and background with artists that share or even expand their values for identifying institutions varied capacities within their various locales and legacies two uh excuse me second problem the artist agent curation uh, uh slash presenter slash institution role and the issues within that first solution getting artists <coughs> basic structural and logistics needs met before they institute before they enter institutions in order to support their work. How do we allow them to understand how to build a tech writer, um, how to build a, a, a press release correctly. Two, um, an example from Painted Bride, holding space to allow the values that we hold dear within our relationships to be reimagined and repurposed in the 21st century. Having access to our own resources that we can be re responsible to in the moment. Uh, three, can we let go of physical spaces? Four, reinvesting our strategy of audience building by attempting to bring work directly to people. Any quick, maybe maybe one quick comment or response to to that summary as well? Yes. I have a question that the uh, part where you said about um, getting artists access to their own I believe I tried to write verbatim I, what I you said. I can hear the question. Yeah. Giving artists 
access to what? You, I, I tried to write verbatim what uh, you had said. You said having the access to our own resources so we can be responsive in the moment. Mm -hmm. Meaning the art, I guess I'm trying to understand so, what that is. Yes, Who's so we, we're, we're looking to sell our building and take our money and invest it and then use the interest from that as the core support of our organization so that we can be responsible in the moment rather than you know, waiting for a, a, a grant that could take a year or two. I, I think the other part of it was that what the painting right is trying to do is that by not having a physical space anymore, they're saying that they have the ability to go to the people, go to the communities, and give the artists resources in different ways than before it was like one of the primary places was the physical space. Secretary, 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 Secretary,
And then um, you know, we've just explored how do you how do you do this in a more connected way. I love the developing affinity groups. I love that. Can I, can I ask what uh, developing these things in a more connected way? What, what does that mean? Well, I think it's really having the dialogue, and then where you're not just doing the you're, you're not just dropping in, doing your art, and leaving, and that you're look you're having the proper lead time to pull in the partners, the whether it's an exhibit, whether it's a community group, um, the, the campus a partner. Um, I told a story that I had a. Uh, a community college that she'd been on campus for 20 years and it wasn't until a certain artist came in with a certain residency activity that allowed her to work with the disabilities office. So just being open to ex that, that exploration in terms of, of the connectedness, is it, taking time to explore. You know what was really interesting, whenever it was possible, uh, as an artist, and this didn't happen all the time, but it didn't happen, uh, when I developed Project for Presenter, and literally I came in a full year before, or uh, maybe six months before developing the project, and made all those community, all those connections with the various community partners. It didn't happen all the time. When it did happen, it led to some beautiful fruition and real community engagement with that presenter, who already had been developing uh, you know, relationships with the Latin American community in their city, and had that, but when we were able to come in earlier and I was able to meet the community partners, it offered them a bilingual example of what we were doing and, and the youth outreach we were doing, it almost always led to a really beautiful and powerful and successful project. But then again, it was just the funding possibility and it could happen in like three days, right? We, we set up all, I come in, you know, did beautifully with that with Tiger Tail Productions in Miami, where I performed a number of times and you know, but that didn't happen all the time. If it did happen, it was beautiful. So, and again, that's always funny. I talked with Laurel, who was mentioning about the Painted Bride, because, you know, Painted Bride were these iconic spaces, but, and then rethinking spaces, right? You know, it's like, wow. You know, that's all, there's models to consider. Um, go ahead. Um, one of the two uh, questions that I solutions um, in terms of communication between the different parties involved. Um, one, if you put your email address down, there is a document that was created yeah, called, it, it's, it's, sorry, a, it wasn't signed in yet. it's a community engagement document that was crafted by several of the APAP fellows from cohort two. That's a series of like five or six questions that they get the presenter to answer and they get the artist to answer. That's about like, Who's your target audience? Who, and this is more for the team, like family space and young audiences. But like, who do you speak to? What themes do you want? Who, like, from the art, and it's a form that each one fills out separately. But when then the presenting organization has it, they can see where the overlaps are. So I think it's a really great way to sort of answer some of these questions. And the second thing, just because I come from a space of really working with culturally specific work um, in South Asian work, is spending the time to, I know within the Indian community or the South Asian community, who the audiences are, like sub audiences are within the larger South Asian community for work. So I articulate that and I put it down on paper. I don't even wait to have it just be in a conversation because recognizing that the conversation that I'm having with the programmer, ultimately the marketing team is someone else and they don't get all the information, right? Like the curator or the programmer, we have these amazing conversations of why we think this work is gonna fit and who it's for. We don't know if they talk to them or translate that to the marketing person at all, right? So I put it down, like I have a description, a marketing description for this is how you're gonna sell it to your Indian audience and this is how you're gonna sell it to your non-Indian audience because the Indian audience is going to connect to these two things. The non-Indian needs to get this version, right? But like, I'll put that down, and even other specifics of like, there's these connections and these connections. You know your work. You're thinking about your audience as an artist when you're thinking of your work. Put it down. No one's a mind reader, and there's multiple people involved. So documenting it and create hand, being able to hand off PDFs, even for the agent or manager, makes it easier. We don't know if someone's going to read it or not, but more chances of communicating. 
You want to add to that real yeah, quick? I do, okay. actually, because I don't want to save the last 10 minutes. I have a specific example of that. A friend of mine who works at a major institution uh, contacted me about bringing audience. Well, I, I'm away in a different city completely. And they were basically saying, hey, Andre, can you possibly send this information of a specific performance that we have dealing with uh, cotillion culture uh, and the prison industrial complex and the incarceration? We're interested in coming to this show. We need audience. And immediately I was just like, and of course it was like the, the, the day before the event was happening, and I was just like, man, that is a huge opportunity missed, you know, because I'm from the city. And it was just like, that, it's a literal part of Chicago culture, Botillians, Cotillians. And again, as you were saying, within the institution, I was like, whoa, th th that's the entire black South Side of Chicago. And so there was something missed in the marketing within the institution to identify that. Because there was no, but, but I don't, I'm not even, I'm not sure. But that's what I mean, like there's an entire, that's, that's, that's a almost 30 year history of black Chicago, almost 40 year. And that they were having trouble bringing audience to a, a, a piece talking about that. That's like having trouble bringing an audience to, in Miami, with, with, with Cuba, you know, with Miami, to, about quinceañeras. That's, that's pretty, you see what I'm saying? So that's a major disconnect. And I think that as presenters and producers and uh, the representatives of organizations, it's our response, it's their, the presenters or our responsibilities to not only understand our communities, but understand who we're bringing in and what re resources they have in, 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 in forwarding their own voice. Because in a lot of these communities, they're evolving, gentrification is, 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 is very real and it's happening so fast. So, you're, we are accessing, we're trying to, the organizations are trying to, in the, in, under the guise of diversity, bring in artists and that, that, that show the diverse change in the communities, but we don't necessarily know how to reach them. And so, and a lot of these organizations do. So the more, echoing what you were saying, the more that, the more that artists can do to say, okay, um, I'm coming to Cheyenne, Wyoming. I have this piece on, uh, Afro-Cuban Orisha culture, okay? Okay, the Cheyenne community is not, not may, may, I don't know, I, I don't know, but they may not have that understanding and know necessarily how to, to, to forward that voice towards their demographic. It's the art, communicate with the artist as a presenter to say, okay, yeah, this is not our, this is not our lane. So how do you want, how do you want us to communicate your vision? Then I think that that allows for the Venn diagram to overlap and so that when the piece comes, that there is some su community support from an aspect of the community that the presenters might not have even known about. <coughs> I feel Rachel's dying to say something. Um, but I really do want to save these last couple minutes, so very quickly for commitment, because that's kind of the ultimate goal of the session. I'll just be very fast. Um, I think this is just a solution. Um, so sometimes uh, that disconnect that you're talking about, Andre, it's because the institution is on a different timeline than the artist's creative process. And it's not just about the communication, it's about figuring out what timeline the institution is on in terms of like how up to speed the marketing department is or um, all of, like the institution's wheels are just moving in a particular order and you have to understand how that order works and each institution has a different internal groove and structure and the way that they move and the way that different departments talk to each other. Um, the other thing I'll say is some of what you're um, calling out, because I think sometimes I try really hard to figure out how the visual arts sector and the performing arts sector can talk to each other and learn, because there's certain things that work better in the visual arts sector and vice versa. So the studio visit is one that works really well in the visual arts sector. That's a one-on-one -on -one conversation over a series of multiple studio visits that you have with an artist where, so it's like that form, but I call it the studio visit. You don't have to have a studio, it could be a laptop or a computer, and the site visit is the other. And that's typical for museums who are working on bigger projects. So like larger commissions, they pull the artists in. So those are just timeline solutions, studio visit, those are, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, to, I'll just add something personally also, or from my have dialogues in past years, uh, a little bit of a takeaway that I'm seeing or subtext from the last few comments. Um, so one of my collaborators, Rennie Harris, uh, always, whenever he goes into a new context, whether it's a school or 
a presentation setting, um, something he always has to re remind others as well as himself is, why do we always have to be the ones to translate ourselves? Um, so, and that's not to say that, and, and that's not to speak to hegemony or oppression specifically or necessarily, it, but it's, in other words, it's a dialogue. We're, we have to translate ourselves for each other as well. I think what, you know, for example, what Rachel just said is also, we, we, have, we as artists have to remember these things just like presenters and everybody has to remember what everybody else is going through. So we literally have six minutes left. Um, what I would really like to do is go around or just open it up. Um, so commitment. For, uh, when Anani and I uh, devised or originally conceived of this session, uh, and for those of you who know her, you can hear her voice saying it, um, you know, what are we gonna do? So, <laughs> so I'm going to channel Ananya, or I just did, I guess, and, uh, and say, you know, what are we going to do? Um, uh, what are you going to do? And so when I, so my provocation earlier, you know, uh, was, was genuine. It, it could be just simply as, like, I'm going to make a phone call because, you know, to a B person to just ask this question, even, or to suggest, make this suggestion. I'm going to write this, that essay that I've been waiting, that I've been putting off for five years about this subject and put it up on medium.com so the right 18 people will see it, <laughs> you know. But, it, what, but you know, I mean, it's funny and I, you know, yeah, and I'm, I'm saying that because my last essay had 18 yeah. readers. Um, <laughs> but maybe, but one of those 18 might book me or when I'm in a position to facilitate something, maybe I'll help to get them booked. You know, so it's it's that sort of thing. So I'm just going to put it out. Um, given all of this very fruitful discussion, which I have your emails now, I pledge. So my commitment is I'm going to pledge to put as much of the information that came out in this hour and a half to send to all of you to keep the conversation going. The note takers, please email me, Michael Sakamoto one at gmail.com. Okay, who wants to go first? I'm going to campaign to everybody. Um, I, uh, I really like the, because I, I, I had heard that CTG's artistic director, um, Michael Ritchie, also had a podcast where he interviews the playwrights. And to, to this podcast idea that Lane was doing that too is amazing and very equalizing. So I, I, my pledge is next time I get presented, I'll insist to whoever presents me, if you're in this room or not, um, that, that we do a, a podcast interview together and, and have a conversation a meaningful conversation publicly before the engagement. So I've been with the NPN for this time uh, and I'm so deeply grateful, but it was artists that recommended me to be part of the NPN uh, and artists that recommended um, my work to other NPN presenters. And granted, I, you know, I performed uh, at the CAC back in 1994 and the following year I was touring internationally, but I've always been committed to uh, many artists have opened the doors for me, and I think that as, as artists ourselves, we need to make sure that we open the doors for others, we even open up a window for another, and, you know, uh, say, hey, you know, you're I would come into space and someone say, oh, last time we had another Latino artist was Guillermo Gomez Peña. I was like, great, let's talk about Elia Arce, let's talk about uh, other people that you may not know, Margaret Gomez, uh, or, but we need to do that. So we need to advocate ourselves, and I'm always committed to doing that. And I think that's a really positive way for us, not just waiting for curators and presenters to say, hey, I recommend this artist. But you get to a space and you recommend another artist. So a specific, concrete, simple action pledge, what would be what? Supporting and recommending other artists. Okay. That's maybe four words. Cool. It's very difficult to be simple. Yeah. Anybody? Elf, who's next? pledge to get a hold of and share Hina's community engagement questionnaire. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people can benefit from that. We can pass them to each other. So wherever, wherever we went, just give it to the next person. And silent pauses are okay. Creativity takes time. One of the things that I've been thinking about, thinking, 
One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is um, there's a lot of dialogue going on in Los Angeles. Um, the Board of Supervisors actually mandated that the um, Los Angeles County um, Arts Commission look at um, cultural equity and inclusion as a through line for everything that they do. And now if you want to apply for a grant from the um, Cultural Affairs Commission, you have to have um, a cultural equity and inclusion policy uh, as part of your organizational um, application. And so one of the things that, you know, um, people were talking about, well, maybe that never gets down to the marketing department or whatever, it's really having a dialogue with all of your colleagues that infuses those bigger issues, those more philosophical and, and policy issues into how the, does that translate into the curatorial process and into the way that you do your work. And so making time, which is always so precious for everybody, but making the time to actually imbue your practical decision making programmatically with those bigger aspirational kinds of things like the MPN is really grappling with right now. How do you build um, cultural equity and inclusion into the DNA of your organization? Um, I think that that's something that can address a lot of the issues that have been um, brought up here because a lot of times we compartmentalize those deeper discussions to the day-to-day decision-making um, points that we have to tackle. So you're, so you're going to boil that down to a... So, um, so making time on a regular basis to have the entire um, team you know, not just the sort of the curatorial or programming team, but your marketing people, your special events people, your development people, be part of that larger, deeper discussion because then that will really translate to how you do your daily work. So is that like cultural equity and empowerment? And empowerment, yeah. This pledge thing is good, it kind of makes you do it. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kava. Uh, one is um, the Walker Publishes Fourth Wall, our online publication. And I want the articles attached to the shows to be writers who are from the communities and also lived experiences related to the artist's work. And when possible, the artists, if they have rapport with writers or individuals who write to start there. I think that's really important to have a dialogue beyond the live performance if possible. So that's one I'm really invested in. Um, the other is I'd love to use that community engagement questionnaire and build it in to give it to our um, evaluator next year who's going to look at our entire curatorial approach and, and you know kind of evaluate, talk with artists, talk with other co co-commissioners, things like that. I think that's a good way to inject it into these questions of how's it going? So that we know what we've been doing. Um, so I'm hoping that could be a step. Mine just comes, I think, from a reflection of a conversation we had in our group about making this space for what for asking in our context, it was the programmer, what do you need? Before, you know, just as a way to start the conversation, and I'm gonna flip it for myself and say, taking a moment to either put it on paper, as she said, or at least say it to myself or somebody else, what do I need before making that initial email, reach out, phone call, whatever it is, and why, would that relationship be authentic beyond the fact that we want to do our work? I mean, that's authentic, that's good. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but going a step deeper to be able to have a honest conversation, to be honest um, with yourself first. That's my alarm telling me. This meeting is over. We'll stay here for another few minutes, um, but I'm just yeah, letting people kind of Sorry, okay, Samsung. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's acknowledge every if people stepping forward. Not everybody has to.
Um, yeah, I think I want to make a commitment to try to do uh, more site visits and more studio visits on the regular basis with everyone um, and take recommendations from other artists uh, to look at other, like artists that they are recommending that I should look at. Because there's so many that are related to this document, I just tried to find it, cannot find it. So my plan is to find it and send it out before the end of the weekend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give everybody's address. I can, I can forward it. Perfect. But okay. before the end of the weekend, I need to find it okay. and send it. <laughs> I pledge to make the space to have a marketing department and a marketing <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a whole other panel. <laughs> Beyond that, for a long time we have been, I'm Beth Boone from Miami Life Project, we've been talking about, um, we have, have a small recording studio in our space where we could do podcasts with Christina Wong. <laughs> the next time she comes to Miami, so I'm going to make a pledge to do that after I get my marketing department. <laughs> okay. Um, any last one? Because I know we're, we're over time and people have to go places. Yeah? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Please, uh, where's the sign up sheet? Okay, so I will get whatever I have to you, my notes. Again, please, note takers, please uh, write down. Oh, okay. And, um, and I'll get that to everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. I'm honored to.